Hi everybody, my name is Chris Weimer. I am co-director of the Center on Poverty and Social Policy, along with um, Irv Garfinkel, who you're gonna hear from later on in the agenda. Um, Center on Poverty and Social Policy, we've been around about six years now. And every May, uh, usually the day after graduation at Columbia, we host uh, a mini conference, which is a half day conference typically, um, where we bring people together um, share some of the research we're doing, sometimes some of the research other people are doing, both in New York City and nationally. And um, it's historically been a great event. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're sad this year, obviously because of the COVID crisis uh, that we won't be able to hold our event in person, but we thought we would still host a virtual event, an abbreviated virtual event, um, in order to hopefully bring people together and talk about some of the um, emerging research around income support and the COVID crisis. Um, so we're sorry people can't be here in person, but we're glad uh, to have, um, looks like a healthy number of people online. Um, just to give a little context of the event, you know, uh, CPSP, uh, the Center on Poverty, we, we aim to do rigorous research, obviously, but also research that is timely and hopefully policy relevant. Um, and so we try to feature some of that research uh, annually at our conference. And we hope to do so today. Um, and nothing is more timely, obviously, than the COVID crisis that we are all um, uh, dealing with currently, uh, especially in New York City, but also across the nation. And um, a lot of our work at CPSP has focused on income supports and how income supports can be approved and improved, sorry, for uh, low-income families, low-income children, um, low-income individuals. So our agenda today is going to focus on income support in the COVID crisis. Um, just to give a little preview of the agenda, um, I'm gonna stop talking in a second. I'm gonna turn it over to Sophie Collier, who is our um, amazing research director at the center. Um, she's gonna give some context uh, and motivation for the event, and then also introduce um, our keynote speaker, who is Representative Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, who we are super lucky to have um, and honored to have, and she will offer some remarks on um, you know, the policy process and the policy supports that are, are being enacted and, and discussed. Um, from there, I'll just pop in briefly and then introduce uh, a, a research panel that will be hosted by Lola Fadulu of the New York Times, um, who we're also very lucky and excited to have. Um, and then um, we'll do a QA and a um, from there and then, you know, close uh, pretty close to one or at one, I should say. Um, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sophie in a second. Um, I just, should just say that uh, the chat function is disabled uh, for this event and everyone sort of by default put on mute because we have so many people. So if you wanna ask a question, um, do that in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen right next to the chat function. Um, and then we'll be monitoring the Q&A um, and you know, answering some questions and then passing some questions along to, to, to Lola. We won't be doing a formal Q&A after, um, after Representative DeLauro's remarks. Um, if you have general questions or follow up after the conference, you can always email us um, at cpsp at columbia.edu. Our website is povertycenter.columbia.edu. And if you are a Twitter uh, member, you can follow us at, uh, at CPSP Poverty. Um, and you're welcome to engage uh, with us there during the conference. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it over to Sophie Collier. Hi, uh, I'm Sophie Collier. I'm a research director here at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy. And thanks so much for joining us today. Um, now, for you and for us, the past two and a half months have probably been otherworldly. And for our team, it's been devastating to watch such a rapid increase in poverty and hardship and disadvantage, both across the country and in our hometown of New York City. But we also know that many of the stories making headlines today aren't necessarily new. Uh, data from the Poverty Tracker, a longitudinal study that we run in partnership with Robinhood, showed that before the COVID outbreak in New York City, over 3 million adult New Yorkers lived in poverty in at least one year between 2014 and 2018. And within a single year, 40% of households ran out of food or worried that they would run out of food because there wasn't enough money to buy more. Now, COVID has only intensified these experiences both in our hometown of New York City and across the country. 
and those who are economically vulnerable have been the hardest hit. As COVID-19 took over life in the city, we immediately fielded a poverty tracker survey on its economic impacts. And preliminary data from that survey shows that over half of those who have lost work for a reason related to COVID were living below 200% of the poverty line before the outbreak. We've also observed an immediate increase in the rate of material hardship with uh, particularly among those who have actually lost work. And we, our preliminary results indicate a 30% increase in the share of workers in this group who have run out of food or are worried that they're going to run out of food before the end of the month because they don't have enough money to buy more. These are just some examples of the distress caused by the pandemic, and we will continue to monitor these trends. And while reviewing these results can elicit real feelings of hopelessness, we also know that there are reasons to feel encouraged. A crisis of this magnitude requires an equivalent response, and we're encouraged by policymakers at the federal level who have put forward some of the largest pieces of legislation in modern history to guard against the enormous toll that this pandemic threatens. Our team has spent the past few months looking at how bad poverty rates could get, the gains and the gaps in the current policy response, and how to build on those gains. And these will be discussed during our panel discussion uh, with Lola Fadulu on the New York Times that I know we're all looking forward to. And then we're also very much encouraged by policymakers who are pushing for more, such as our keynote speaker. Congresswoman DeLauro is a representative and lifelong resident of Connecticut's third congressional district. She's active in crafting the policy response to COVID-19 and be able to give us an insight into the challenge from her inside perspective. Hers is a legislative portfolio marked by foresight, persistence, and wide subject area expertise in areas of poverty, health, and the well being of children and families. She is chair of the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Appropriations Subcommittee, where she oversees our investments in education, health, and employment, all departments that are crucial every day and vital in this moment. And many of the policy recommendations that will be discussed during the panel come from bills originally introduced by Congresswoman DeLauro. She first introduced paid sick leave legislation through the Healthy Families Act in 2004, as well as paid family and medical leave legislation in the Family Act of 2013. She's also worked to expand the child tax credit since March 2003, when she first offered an amendment to the Budget Committee to include all children who are currently left out by the system. Uh, the child tax credit system, excuse me. She's also long championed, and the, long championed the expansions to SNAP, especially in times of crisis. And she secured a 13.6 increase in the SNAP program in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. She always grounds her policy proposals in the evidence and reading her book, The Least Among Us, you're troubled by the problem she describes, but motivated by her vision and her empathy. All that's to say, she's someone to listen to, and I'm so happy that we all have that opportunity today. So I'm gonna pass it over to Congresswoman Deloro, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Sophie, for that really lovely, lovely introduction. But I thank you so much for the work that you do as research director at Columbia, uh, at the universities, at the center, at, you know, so poverty and social policy. Uh, this is an institution uh, there's a critical leader, a resource for those of us uh, who are concerned about inequality, about inequity and policies that put people first. I also want to recognize your moderator today, Lola Fadulu, uh, and thank you, Lola, for shining a light on poverty and the social safety net. Uh, I'm so honored to join all of you to be a part of this conference uh, as you spotlight income support in this crisis and beyond. Um, it's a particular honor considering the work that CPSP does. You know, as a legislator, uh, I turn to your rigorous research. You are ahead of the curve. You have the latest and the sharpest takes on the challenges that we face as a nation, and importantly, the challenges that individuals face in their communities every day. And your work stands apart for its clarity, its breadth, its impact, the analysis, is it's, it's rigor and hard data to make tangible that which is often intangible, to make seen what is too often unseen, and to record what is too often forgotten. 
So I acknowledge you, your researchers, uh, those who will be speaking today, uh, Zachary Parolin, uh, Megan Curran, Jane Waldfogel, co-director of the uh, Columbia Population Research Center, Chris Weimer, uh, CPSP co-director, the whose work I rely on, Irv Garfinkel, another CPSP co-director, who testified about child poverty before my House subcommittee in March as a panelist for the National Academy of Sciences. Your research is so important for the work that we do in Washington and in government, more important now than ever. This is the biggest economic and health crisis that our country has ever faced. The United States is now the epicenter of a global pandemic. Cases of the coronavirus are rising. And to slow the spread of contagion, serious measures of social distancing are underway. Schools closed, businesses shuttered, and now are struggling to reopen. Months into the pandemic, the numbers are almost beyond words. More than 92,000 dead, more than one and a half million confirmed cases, more than 36 million initial unemployment claims in the past two months, with the April jobs report showing the highest national unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And we've had new numbers today. The latest economic data in the United States confirmed that people are facing depression level hardship due to this virus. According to Chad Stone, the chief economist with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, job losses in April alone exceeded total job losses due to the Great Recession. And I quote, employer payrolls shrank by 8.7 million jobs between December 2007 and February 2010, compared with 20.5 million in April. Today's news, 38 million jobless Americans in nine weeks. 2.4 million claims filed just last week. The, the view is, is that we will look at unemployment going up to 20%. We are hemorrhaging. And we have an administration, very honestly, in recent days have talked about wanting to roll back expanded unemployment benefits, taking away what is a lifeline. We have state budget shortfalls, which could reach the highest on record. States and localities have already furloughed or fired nearly 1 million workers in April alone. That is more than the aftermath of the Great Recession. So people are fighting for their lives and their economic survival. And this is not temporary. The Congressional Budget Office projects the unemployment rate will remain elevated through next year. The impacts on people are harrowing. Your institution raised the alarm. Your poverty reports from mid-April revealed that poverty in the United States could reach the highest level in over 50 years. And I quote, from 12.4% to 18.9%, 21 million more people in poverty, with the poverty rates among African Americans and children especially alarming. Hunger as well. Northwestern University's Institute for Policy Research said last week, and I quote, in April, food insecurity doubled overall and tripled among those with children. I've heard from thousands of people in Connecticut, people who have fallen ill, or whose loved ones are in the hospital, people who have lost their jobs, whose small business has closed, or have had to leave their school early. So many do not know how they are going to pay the bills or keep food on the table. So I believe our response must be equal to that challenge. It is what I have been fighting to do. I have the honor of chairing the subcommittee in the House of Representatives that is central to addressing this pandemic. It funds federal programs in health, labor, and education. And we have passed multiple emergency packages to get workers, families, and businesses to the dawn of recovery. And I believe the different relief packages have included an unprecedented level of income support. The first, 
The family's first bill was to address the public health needs of the nation. Then the CARES Act was to address the economic well-being of working people and middle-class families. The CARES Act authorized direct payments to people up to $1,200 for individuals, $2,400 for married couples, and an additional, an additional $500 per child. I wanted to count everyone in the household as a full person. But what we received is that we treated children differently than adults. In addition, we invested Medicaid benefits and food security. We established for the first time ever limited federal paid sick days and paid leave. And we provided free coronavirus testing for all, even the uninsured. We secured three and a half billion dollars for the Child Care Development Block Grant, 360 million for programs at the Department of Labor. And we expanded unemployment benefits, providing an additional federal benefit of $600 per week on top of the state benefit for up to four months, fully restoring the wage of the average worker. 13 weeks of additional unemployment compensation benefits for those who need them in all states. To build on the CARES Act, the Congress passed an interim package, CARES 1.5. It was economic relief. It was a package to support small businesses, their owners, their families, and their workers. Then last week, the House passed our latest package, the HEROES Act. It is a critical $3 trillion rescue for our frontline workers, our cities and states, our small businesses. It creates a kind of modern day safety net that I have been fighting for with so many brave allies in the Congress and outside of the Congress. People are drowning. The Senate wants to wait and see. We do not want delay. The president's appointee to chair the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, has even said that more appears necessary. When he was questioned about what has been signed into law, Mr. Powell said, we must ask, and I quote, is it enough? With respect to income support, the HEROES Act again puts money in the pockets of workers with a second round of direct payments to families, counting children and adults the same, up to $6,000 per household. And millions of families with older children and disabled dependents get the economic relief payments they need to survive. New, world, new payroll protection measures would keep 60 million workers connected with their jobs and extend weekly $600 federal unemployment payments through next January. The HEROES Act also fills in the gaps left from previous packages to make paid sick days and paid family and medical leave available to all workers, including those working in warehouses, healthcare, grocery stores, pharmacies, and retail. And it provides a 15% increase in the maximum monthly supplemental nutrition assistance program, the food stamp program, so that working families can keep food on the table. And it provides strong support for our heroes by establishing a $200 billion heroes fund to ensure that essential workers across the country receive hazard pay. In my mind, however, the most important part of the package is the child tax credit. We make the child tax credit available for all families, raised to $3,000 per child, and a higher benefit for young children, $3,600. The child tax credit is our nation's largest federal expenditure on children. It is a vehicle for raising children and families out of poverty. And it was conceived and supported on a bipartisan basis. We've had expanded, we've expanded it many times, and most significantly as part of the Recovery Act in 2009. And now 
According to CPSP estimates, it lifts approximately one in six previously poor children and their families above the poverty line. But the last package has important shortcomings. And we know from CPSP estimates, the current child tax credit leaves behind one third of all children who are in families who earn too little to get the full credit. And those who are left behind include one half of African-American and Hispanic children. Why? As mind boggling as this seems, because their parents earn less than other parents. These are the very people who need help now most of all. We can and we must do more for our families and our youngsters. So House Democrats made the child tax credit fully refundable so that the poorest amongst us are eligible, essentially establishing a child allowance for the first time ever. It also created a young child tax credit of $3,600 for children under the age of six. It increased the value of the child tax credit for those over six to $3,000. And the legislation advances the credit in monthly increments since bills do not just arrive at the end of the year. We know how transformative this can be. This fall, the National Academy of Sciences released a report examining policies to cut child poverty. And let me recognize Irv Garfinkel again, who was an NAS panelist on this report. And I also might add with great pride that our House subcommittee, Labor, Health and Human Services and Education, provided the funds for this report to be produced. They found that of all the policies they examined, that a child tax credit along the lines of what the House has proposed would have the greatest impact on reducing poverty. In fact, in normal times, the policy we have proposed would cut child poverty by nearly 40% and cut deep poverty amongst children and families in half. This is particularly important for communities of color. Early data showed that African-Americans made up 30% of the cases of the environment when they make up only 13% of the population. So strengthening and expanding the child tax credit can be transformational for communities of color and for everyone. I want to emphasize the historic change that we achieved. And we are not going back. This kind of income support for all through the child tax credit is no longer theoretical. It is now firmly part of a new safety net. Look at our allies. In the midst of this crisis, Canada increased their child benefit in response to COVID with a system already in place. And just this weekend, they announced another increase to take into account the cost of living. So I will continue to press the U.S. Senate to enact this evidence-based policy now. And I want to enlist your support in pressing the Senate. Youngsters and families cannot wait. Expanding the child tax credit as we did in the HEROES Act will help avoid the long-lasting damage caused by severe economic insecurity and speed our economic recovery. And finally, let me touch on paid leave and paid sick days. I know that Jane Waldfogel is gonna speak later. She has provided so much of the essential research on paid leave. And Jane, your work is such an important component of our work, and we thank you. We know how crucial paid leave can be for families as income support. And I will note it is widely popular with voters on both sides of the aisle. It is no surprise. No one should face the impossible choice of their health or their paycheck. So the HEROES Act closes gaps in current law, making paid sick days and paid family and medical leave available to all workers, including those working in warehouses, healthcare, grocery stores, pharmacies, and retail related to COVID-19. 
This is necessary. As I said earlier in this pandemic, the Congress passed for the very first time ever, limited paid sick days, including care for another individual by COVID-19, limited paid leave for parents whose children are out of school or childcare, but revisions from the administration, as well as corporate friendly guidance from the Department of Labor, left out millions of workers from these protections. The Center for American Progress released analysis, which found, and I quote, only 47% of private sector workers will have guaranteed COVID-19 related emergency paid leave as a result of the administration's revisions. Those excluded, frontline healthcare workers, first responders, battling to save humanity from this pandemic, individuals working at businesses of more than 500 employees, as many as 2 million grocery workers ineligible. This is unacceptable. No one, no one should fall through the cracks, not in this crisis, not in any crisis, and not in this country. The child tax credit, paid leave, paid sick days. These are the policies I am fighting for in the House of Representatives. Families are struggling with bills they cannot pay, with pantries they cannot fill, with children they cannot feed, with prescriptions that they cannot fill. The genesis of the economic crisis predates this pandemic and will outlast it if we do not enact lasting changes for our families and for our children. The recovery from the Great Recession took a dozen years for poverty rates to fall back to where they were beforehand. And I believe this is, in due, is due in part to fundamental shifts in the national and global economy, but also in part to the failure of federal imagination. We did not seize the opportunity to provide the robust supports necessary. We started and then we stopped. In the midst of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act into law, providing economic security to retired workers. At that time, poverty amongst the elderly exceeded 50%, by 2005, closer to 10%. It is our choice to be meek or to be bold. To the Senate and the White House, I say, let us be bold. Let us enact policies like the child tax credit, like paid leave, like paid sick days. We can restore the social safety net. We can mitigate this crisis and we can prepare Americans, not just for the next crisis, but to prepare them for prosperity. I'm very proud of what we have done for income support in the different packages. And I look forward to building on them, especially as we continue to look at your rigorous work, your research, which underpins all of this. I thank you for that work. I thank you for that research. And I thank you for making a difference. I thank you for welcoming me today. It is an honor and please everyone stay safe. Thank you so much, Representative DeLauro. We, we have everyone muted, so I'm sure you would get a giant round of applause right now <laughs> if we didn't have the mute. You put, um, thank you so much for sharing both your comments today with us and, and your time with us today. And then also thank you obviously for the work that you're doing both in the crisis and then, you know, well before. Um, so with that, we're going to move along to our panel discussion. Um, and I want to just briefly introduce Lola Fadulu, who is with the New York Times. She is the David Rosenbaum Reporting Fellow um, out of the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, previously uh, with the Atlantic. Um, and she covers poverty and federal safety net programs. So we're truly um, honored to have her here and lead a discussion about some of the Center on Poverty and Social Policies work around COVID. So I will um, turn it over to Lola right now. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining in today. Um, I am looking forward to speaking with each of the researchers about their latest findings related to COVID-19. 
Um, so let's start, let's dive right in. Um, I would love it if each of the panelists could give a quick overview of their, of their latest findings and then we'll go from there. We can start with Zach. Sure, thanks Lola. Thanks for being here as well. With my colleagues, Chris Weimer and Megan, both who are here today, we've been working to understand what this crisis means for the economic security of families across the country and specifically trying to understand how these rising unemployment rates might lead to higher poverty rates. So in a brief we released last month, we projected the potential rise in poverty under three scenarios of rising unemployment rates. If unemployment rates climb to 10% or 20% or 30%. And to summarize our findings, we find that if unemployment rates do climb towards 20% or even inch towards 30%, we might see poverty rates in this country that we have not seen since at least 1967, the first year for which we have reliable income data. Now this is all before taking the CARES Act into account we do have some new estimates of poverty and the potential poverty reduction effect of the CARES Act that I know we might talk about during the panel today. So I'll save that discussion for later and I'll stop there for now and turn it over to uh, Megan, I believe. Hi, thanks very much. Um, my name is Megan Curran. And as many of my colleagues um, with me at the Center on Poverty, my research focuses on how the tax system and social safety net can work better for children and families. Um, using that lens, I've been looking at the impact of the federal response to date, much of which was outlined by Congresswoman DeLauro, and um, trying to get a sense of basically who's receiving this really critical support and who um, still needs to be reached. So the, taken all together, the various pieces that the Congresswoman outlined, we know that um, the federal response to date has real potential to mitigate some of the worst economic effects here. Um, but there are also some restrictions or just some gaps that still need to be filled because um, some folks are not receiving it. So some research that we released this morning finds that in terms of the cash stimulus checks, um, we're still needing to reach about 30 million more folks who are income eligible, but not currently able to access it. These are dependents of, you know, older teenagers, young adults, so older folks with health issues and also many immigrant families. And I can talk more about that later. So taken all together, um, you know, the, the federal response is reaching um, many, many families and is a real lifeline, but there are also some extra steps that Congress can take in order to target additional relief to those who need it most. So I'm Jane Waldfogel, I'll go next. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, Congresswoman DeLauro again for that inspirational talk. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and for your leadership on these issues. And thank you for emphasizing the importance of paid leave. Uh, we know from national data that 30% uh, or more of workers don't have any paid sick leave at all on their jobs. And we know that probably about 80% don't have any paid family leave on their jobs. Uh, work, from work we've been doing with our poverty tracker data in New York City, we know that those who lack leave are those who are hardest up. Uh, the lowest income workers uh, are disproportionately likely, those who live in hardship are disproportionately likely not to have paid leave. So the measures that have been passed uh, through the CARES Act couldn't be more important uh, and they're really unprecedented. So through the CARES Act, uh, workers, many, many workers in the United States now have two weeks of paid sick leave that they can use not just when they're sick, but if they're quarantined or isolated. Um, and then many, many workers in the United States have up to 12 weeks of paid sick or family leave that they can use if their child is sick or isolated or if their child is home from daycare or school. Uh, so this is really unprecedented. It's the first time we've had federal uh, paid family leave. And I wanted to specifically mention it because I know that uh, these provisions are not well known. Uh, so I want to emphasize that uh, we, there now is at the federal level, thanks to Representative uh, DeLauro's uh, leadership, uh, paid sick leave and paid family leave for the first time. This is on top of many states and cities that have enacted these kinds of benefits and many places which have adapted their benefits to address COVID. So this is an area that's changing really rapidly. 
And um, so this is, this is a, a piece of actually good news. And I'll hand to Irv. Thank you, Jane. Also want to thank uh, Representative DeLauro for her wonderful leadership uh, in this area. Um, she said uh, a lot of things that I uh, will touch on uh, as we talk a little more. Um, the research that I've done looks at the uh, what the effects of extending the uh, child tax credit, making it fully refundable, converting it to a child allowance, what effect that would have on poverty. I uh, also looked at more, even more universal programs, uh, basic, uh, basic income, and I'll have some more to say about that. Um, I do want to emphasize uh, the last thing I'll say, um, the comment that Rosa made about the um, fact that the child benefit is not equal to the adult benefit, and our research shows that that's a fundamental error in terms of child poverty. Um, if we had equal child benefits, that would make a huge difference. And the um, nothing is more important than the, for the future of our country than investing in our children and most especially in our poorest children. They will have the greatest return on whatever money we give them. They will earn more, they will live longer, they will be healthier adults as a consequence. So, thanks Lola, back to you. Thank you. So Zach, I wanna start with you. Um, your research is particularly timely today, um, given the fact that we saw an additional 2.4 million people filed for unemployment last week, um, bringing that number up to um, over 38 million um, in the past nine weeks of this crisis. Um, could, could you start talking about, start by talking about um, why the unemployment rate is so tied to the poverty rate and what that might say about the safety net here in the US? Yeah, absolutely. So for most families out there, their primary source of income is going to be from market earnings and it's particularly working age families. So when you lose your job, you lose your market earnings. And the question is, what's there left for you? What's, what's waiting for you if you become unemployed? And the unfortunate reality in the United States over the last 20 years is that we've seen a decline of out of work cash assistance and an increase in benefits that are conditional on employment. If you think of the earned income tax credit, for example, or the child tax credit. Right now, if you aren't working, you don't get these benefits. Mm -hmm. If you're jobless, but you're receiving SNAP benefits or cash assistance from temporary assistance for needy families, there are now more stringent work requirements on these programs, meaning that if you're jobless for a long enough time, you might eventually lose these benefits. Now, unemployment insurance is supposed to be there for individuals who lose their jobs, but the reality there is in normal times, a small fraction of jobless individuals receive UI support. And even despite the expansion of UI during the crisis right now, we're seeing stories from a lot of states that their UI systems just aren't able to keep up with the demand. So in Kansas, not far from where I grew up, you call the UI hotline on a certain day of the week, depending on the first letter of your last name. In Florida, we see these lines uh, to pick up the paper applications because the online systems and the phone systems are so overloaded. So the sad reality is that a lot of families are falling through the cracks right now. The American welfare state was not built uh, for this moment, particularly due to the decline of out-of-work out of cash assistance over the last 20 years. And as a result, there's a lot of families right now who are hurting and need more support. I see. And um, I found it interesting that um, as you uh, forecasted what the poverty rates um, could look like as unemployment rate, as the unemployment rate continues to soar. Um, I found it interesting that you use the supplemental um, me poverty measure instead of the official um, poverty measure. Um, why, what, why did you do that? Yeah, sure. So the supplemental poverty measure or the SPM is generally recognized as a more scientifically advanced measure of poverty relative to the official poverty measure or the OPM. And I guess I'll touch on just a couple major differences. With the SPM, we're counting all 
taxes and transfers when we calculate family resources. So SNAP benefits, for example, uh, refundable tax credits from EITC, those are counted in the SPM framework, but not in the official poverty measure framework. There's also differences in poverty thresholds based on where you live. So if you live in New York City, under the SPM framework, you're going to have a higher poverty threshold than you would have if you live in state where because the cost of living is higher in New York City. That's taken into account in the SPM framework, but again, not in the OPM framework. There's some other differences, but I think what I want to highlight right now is that the latest official estimates of either the SPM or the OPM are for the year 2018. And you know, given the state we're in now, estimates of poverty from 2018 just aren't that useful for us. So that's why I've been working with my colleagues, uh, Chris and Megan and others, to be able to update those estimates of SPM poverty on a monthly basis. So now for April 2020, and to be able to continue to, to update those estimates of poverty uh, throughout the crisis and beyond on a more timely basis. I see. And I know that you said earlier um, that you're beginning to see how these um, estimates uh, will be affected by um, some of the provisions in the CARES Act, um, namely expanding eligibility for unemployment insurance and the um, economic stimulus payments. Would you mind sharing some of those, those new findings? Absolutely. So, I mean, the first thing I think I'll say is that the CARES Act is huge. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office is projecting uh, potential increase of spending of up to $450 billion in income support. And to put that number in context, $450 billion is more than all the money that was spent on non-retirement income transfers in 2019. A lot more than the CTC, EITC, SNAP combined, and so on. So this is massive. Now, the big question when we go to simulate poverty rates and understand how this impacts poverty is, are people actually able to access what the CARES Act is meant to provide? Again, I gave the examples of a lot of families struggling to get through state government's archaic unemployment insurance systems. If they succeed in that, uh, and they get that $600 a week bonus on top of their standard unemployment insurance, we're seeing that that has a pretty for most families receiving those benefits, it uh, seems plausible that it's going to keep them out of poverty. Of course, the recovery rebates or the cash payment also seems to have a strong poverty reduction effect. So I'll close by saying this, there is potential for the CARES Act to reduce poverty rates to pre-crisis levels, but only if access is high enough. And number two, that comes with a lot of short-term hardship as families await those benefits. Mm -hmm. And number three, these benefits are concentrated in March to July. Right now, the unemployment insurance benefits, uh, the $600 a week bonus, will expire at the end of July. So if the crisis continues beyond then, or at least high unemployment rates, there's a decent chance that families are going to need additional income support after that, if they wanna be able to pay rent and put food on the table. It, so it sounds like the, the CARES Act has um, provided a, a lot of um, resources um, to Americans, but whether those Americans uh, can access those benefits proves to be an issue. Um, Megan, I know that you have uh, spent a lot of time uh, examining the CARES Act and, um, and, and looking at who doesn't have access, who is still waiting for their benefits. Would you mind um, talking a bit about how exactly the CARES Act, um, what specific ways the CARES Act um, supports uh, families and households? Sure, so um, some of this um, was laid out um, really well by Congresswoman DeLauro, and she was explaining that um, some of the two biggest um, income supports in the CARES Act are the, that expanded unemployment insurance and that cash payment. So expanded unemployment insurance or UI um, is now reaching, you know, there's ba basically been three major expansions. It's now reaching more people than ever used to be able to access it. So it's, it's including people who, um, you know, might work part-time or self-employed or they're independent freelancers or they had a broken work history, they were usually not able to be covered by UI. Now they are, that's huge. Um, it's also giving those extra 13 weeks because we are anticipating that unemployment is going to be, um, you know, a, unfortunately a prolonged issue. And it's also giving that $600 a week temporary top-up payment through July, 
which um, is really important because regular UI payments um, usually actually only cover a fraction of people's earnings before they lose their job. And so this $600 a week top up is actually just bringing them up closer to what they had been earning beforehand. And it's really trying to smooth the incomes that people have lost right now. The cash payment is again um, really important because it has a very broad reach in that there's no minimum income required to receive it. You could have low or no earnings, but you also, if you're in a family with a married couple, receive it up to $150,000. So it's trying to reach um, you know, a broad swath of people, get money into the hands of families to spend it in the way that they need to do so. And um, it's also delivered almost automatically for many people who have been filing taxes recently. The issue is that for some of the most vulnerable folks, those who haven't filed taxes recently, usually because they haven't earned enough to have to, to owe anything, um, they have to proactively go and apply for the cash payment. And they would still receive it, but it might be delayed they might not be aware that they have to do this. They might need assistance to have to do it. And, you know, community social service agencies or tax prep sites that are usually able to help folks with this kind of thing, um, you know, due to the lockdown, they're probably not able to, to help in the way that they used to. So, um, you know, so there are some, some issues there, even though the cash payment has the potential to reach folks. And then I can also touch on um, some of the folks who unfortunately are also restricted from accessing it as well. I see. Um, and so I know we've been talking a lot about cash payments, um, but I would love to hear more from Jane about um, these paid sick leave policies. Um, I'm wondering if you could sort of tell us uh, what these policies um, and, and this, at the state level in New York and, and New York City, what they looked like before the pandemic and, and maybe who was left out? Sure. Um, so New York City was one of those um, states and one of those localities that already had a paid sick leave law. Uh, so that in principle should have covered most uh, workers. Uh, the work that we've done with the poverty tracker found that actually 30% of workers had at least some days that they were sick when they were not being paid by their employer. So it turns out that the coverage was not uh, universal. And similar to national data, uh, the workers who were left out are disproportionately the low income workers, uh, part-time workers uh, tend to be especially vulnerable. And almost always, in, in almost all studies that I've done, uh, Hispanic workers are even holding constant uh, education level, skill level, and part-time status. Hispanic workers are less likely to be covered. And um, we don't understand well uh, why that occurs, because uh, there's really no explanation for it in the data, uh, except possibly some form of discrimination. I see. And would you mind talking more about um, how the uh, new sick leave provisions provided by the federal government overlap with, with what's going on in states and cities? Yeah, good question. It's super complicated. Um, my colleague, Matt Maury, uh, is really the expert on this. And one of the things that he's hammered home for me is that these things are not stackable. Uh, so in particular, you cannot combine the federal and the state benefits you can combine the federal and the city benefits. So uh, the federal benefits are intended to fill in, in the, for the vast majority of states that didn't already at the state level have paid sick leave. So if your state already had paid sick leave uh, that was comparable to the federal benefit, you can't take the state benefit plus the federal benefit, uh, but you can stack the federal and the city or the state and the city. Um, my reading of it is that at this point, without you know, further state augmentation, the federal benefits really trump what any state has done and are better. Um, and in particular, because the federal benefits really paved new, new ground in covering families who need to take pay sick or family leave because schools are closed or daycares are closed or because they're quarantined or because someone possibly has been exposed but is not yet ill. Uh, typically, sick leave and family leave would not cover those kinds of situations. So the federal benefits are really, um, I, I think, are superior. But, you know, I, there's always this caution that this is evolving quickly and states and localities are amending their laws to 
be more expansive now and to cover COVID. So it's always worth checking your specific locality and your specific state. I see. And I, I know that you mentioned um, that uh, Hispanic communities are among those who um, may not be covered by these um, sick leave policies. Megan, I want to return to you for a second. I know that you said um, that um, there are populations that have still not been able to get access, specific ones. Um, has, has this been, um, has what Jane said, is that uh, consistent with what you found in your research? Could you talk more about who's left out? Yeah, there would be some overlap with people who were left out, um, for sure, across some of the different expansions. So um, for unemployment insurance, um, you know, it, it includes a lot more people, but it still doesn't reach undocumented folks. Um, so the Migration Policy Institute had identified, you know, there's around 7 million undocumented people employed in the last few years. Many of those are in essential worker positions right now, um, serving their communities, but if they happen to lose their job, there's really no, no resources available for them. Um, the cash payment, again, reaches a huge amount of folks, and it's very importantly reaching those um, with no or low income. But there have been a couple of exclusions that um, you know, might have seemed uh, fairly innocuous at first, but actually are, are impacting a lot more people. So we have a paper up on our website as of this morning that talks about the 30 million individuals who are not receiving the cash payment, even though they're in families whose incomes would qualify for them. Half of those are dependents, um, age 17 and over, who are still claimed by their families for tax purposes. So we're talking about 10 million 17 to 24 year olds who are still in high school and college. They can't receive the payment. Um, and we're talking about 5 million older folks, um, health issues, disabilities, um, basically high need and low income who are also not able to, to receive the payment. And then the other half is 15 million people in immigrant families where at least one filer, one adult in the family um, has an ITIN, which is an individual taxpayer identification number rather than a social security number. And the last piece I'll say about this is just that that's a rather unprecedented exclusion here because the, if someone doesn't have a social security number, it's not just knocking out the cash payment for the, that individual, it's knocking out the payment for their spouse and their children who very well might be US citizens or green card holders. And we're talking about millions of US citizens and, and green card holders here who are not receiving the payment just because one parent happens to hold an ITIN. So we have new information on the website about the impact of that by states. Um, but as Congresswoman Delora pointed out, um, the HEROES Act that the House just recently passed did try and fix a lot of these exclusions, which would be huge and make the cash payment a lot more um, accessible and effective. But we're, um, we'll have to see if the Senate actually turns that into law. I see. And I know that um, that IRV has also um, proposed some other ways of uh, getting income to people who may not currently um, have access to the CARES Act um, and the other uh, federal provisions. Would you, IRV, would you mind um, talking more about um, sort of uh, the need for, for new designs for guaranteed income? So I think the... Um big argument for new designs or at least modifications of what we're doing is that what we're currently doing uh, is not well designed, is not well set up. And I just want to emphasize two aspects of that. Uh, one, to reiterate what uh, Congresswoman uh, DeLauro said about um, the child tax credit. So it's a wonderful example. A, child, a credit is more progressive than a deduction in the income tax because deductions are worth more the higher your tax rate. Whereas with a credit, it's the same amount. And currently the credit is 2000 per child. Um, so, and about two thirds of American children uh, get that credit. Uh, so we're two-thirds of the way to a child allowance economically, but the third, the biggest group that doesn't get it are the poorest children in the country. And um, getting it regularly, not just as a tax deduction, but getting it as a child allowance paid out monthly, 
uh, that would uh, be a huge improvement that it's, uh, we're the only industrialized nation that does not have a universal child allowance. Uh, second, um, one of the nice things about the CARES Act is that it uh, enacted what's basically a universal basic income, uh, not of the kind that presidential candidate Andrew Yang proposed, uh, but it did copy one thing that he proposed, which is, uh, well, a little better than what he proposed, only benefits for adults, zero benefits for children. The CARES Act has a child benefit of $500. Um, one of the th things that is most uh, exciting about the research we've done is that if you had a universal benefit of $250 per person, um, you could finance almost entire amount of that benefit simply by making the in federal income tax more progressive. So instead of having deductions, uh, a standard deduction, itemized deductions, if you get rid of all of those, you could finance five sixths of the cost of a two hundred and fifty dollar per month uh, universal benefit to everyone, and you could finance the remaining fifth by a carbon tax, and the um, the regressivity of that carbon tax would more than be made up uh, by making the federal income tax more progressive. Mm -hmm. All of your uh, responses have um, inspired several questions from the audience, um, and I want to get to those before we wrap up. Um, the first question um, is for Zach, um, and the audience member is asking, how would you craft a COVID response to most cost-effectively reduce or stabilize poverty to avoid the potential incre increases you mentioned? Sure, that's a challenging question, but thanks for that. I, I I think there's uh, two goals here. First and foremost, we wanna make sure that any individual who loses his or her job has an adequate share of that former earnings replaced through unemployment insurance or some type of policy that is able to quickly and efficiently restore uh, some share of that lost earnings. Again, the idea here is to reduce this economic insecurity that comes with job loss through a quick replacement in earnings in the form of income transfers. So that's the first challenge. And then I think the second challenge, there's a lot of individuals who are already jobless or are currently locked out of the present UI system. How do we make sure that those families uh, that are also suffering, uh, maybe didn't have a lot of earnings before, but still need some type of income support, how do we make sure that they're taken care of? And there's a lot of ways through immediate expansions and SNAP or cash assistance from TANF or IRV suggestions for a uh, universal cash allowance. These types of policies would make sure that those families are reached as well. And we'll take one more question from the audience. Um, this one is for the panel, for the, for the entire panel. Um, do the panelists have any sense of how much private charities have contributed to address the issue of poverty and hunger since the COVID crisis started? Um, we know that in New York City, uh, Robin Hood, uh, who we partner with on the Poverty Tracker, has been super active in COVID relief, as they were with Hurricane Sandy uh, way back when. Um, I, think, I think in the month of March, they raised and distributed something like $21 million is off the top of my head was the figure. Uh, so in places like New York City, they've been very active. And, you know, certainly we've seen um, pictures from around the country of food banks and other charities stepping up. Uh, I think though those private charities would be the first to say that they can't do it on their own. And in, even in good times, they can't do it on their own. They're supplementing what government does. But in this period of time, uh, they would be swamped without the government assistance. So uh, uh, whatever they're doing is complementary to the type of income supports that we've been talking about. But it's a very good question. I would I would add that the um, uh, just the a, a night ago two nights ago I saw uh, someone who's a head of a national food bank uh, 
And her bottom line statement was, we need food stamps to be expanded. We cannot handle uh, the, the increased demands that are being made. Uh, that's just overwhelming. I see. And we actually have time for a few more questions. I misspoke earlier. Um, so the next question is also for the entire panel. Um, the question is, wouldn't it be much more efficient to have direct transfer, <clears throat> excuse me, wouldn't it be much more efficient to have direct transfer payments to poor families with children than using a tax credit mechanism where the benefits are enjoyed only once a year after a lengthy delay and most of the benefits go to the families who pay taxes at the highest rates? So, um, uh, yes and no. <laughs> the, uh, if you aid only the poorest people, uh, those benefits are stigmatized. And the implication is that uh, only the poorest uh, uh, need assistance. And in fact, our research uh, in New York City shows that close to half of the population experiences poverty over a four-year period. And so there's lots of in and out and up and down. And the lower middle class uh, periodically becomes poor. Even middle class families uh, would benefit from a universal child allowance. Um, and our, our estimates show that, in fact, if you converted and paid a child allowance and financed it out of the, uh, by making the federal in, uh, uh, income tax more progressive, that um, it would be only the top 10th of the population that would experience uh, increase in taxes. Net benefits would go to the bottom 90%, uh, and uh, sorry, bottom 80% actually. Uh, and that that would be a very good thing. And, and those benefits would not be stigmatized. And they would promote social solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is for Irv and Megan. Um, would you mind speaking to the differential effects of direct payments to families and other types of social economic supports at the school or neighborhood level? Megan, do you want to? Sure. Um, I mean, we're seeing uh, huge impacts on uh, children's schooling in particular right now and teenagers and young adults, um, which means that they could be recognized more in the federal response than they have been to date. Congresswoman DeLauro um, highlighted the fact of the disparity in the payment levels and Irv touched on the importance of having sort of the same payment rate across um, you know, adults and children in general, because right now the cash stimulus payment is really important, but it is, um, you know, working in a bit of a, to the, a bit of a disadvantage to families with kids because the $1,200 adult rate and the $500 child rate uh, means that children are only receiving less than half of the, the, the cash relief that adults are. So a family that's um, a married couple with no children ends up receiving more in the emergency cash relief than um, a family with one single parent and two kids, even though that second family is actually larger. And in terms of, you know, the effects that those families are feeling at home, um, you know, the schools are out, um, technology and basic internet access is desperately needed in the household, devices are needed to access classes. Um, and, you know, there's a real case to be made for doing what has been proposed in the HEROES Act, which is, you know, making um, more regular payments, but also making sure that kids are actually receiving something that is at least the same value as something that an adult is receiving. Well, thank you so much. I got a lot out of this conversation and I know that the audience did as well. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Chris Weimer now to close up the event. Thank you so much, Lola. And uh, thank you to the panel for a great discussion. Uh, time really does fly. Uh, you know, we did an abbreviated session for just one hour and we probably could have kept going. Um, but like Sonia said in the chat um, function, if uh, you have questions that didn't get answered or questions that come up later, please email us at cpsp at columbia.edu. Uh, 
um, or reach out and feel free to check out our website, propertycenter.columbia.edu. We thank you all so much for joining us this year. We hope to be back in person next year and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day and stay safe.